got a beautiful day. Where are you from? Uh, from the UP of Michigan. All right. Where at? On Tanagan. <laughs> My wife and I have worked for the park for a number of years, but we're seasonal, and I, thought, I like, love going up to there. But it's so different from our area here. It's yeah. just, there's a very difference. There's a unique spot up there, we like going up to Copper Harbor and all that. Oh, yeah. Stuff. The key went off. Yes, yes. Well, welcome to the island. My name is Fred. I'm the ranger out here. We're going to talk a little bit about the history of this lighthouse. We'll take you through and we'll reach up to the top of the tower today. Uh, the story of Raspberry actually goes back to uh, an event that happened at the opposite end of this lake in 1855. And it forever changed our area here and the area where you're from in Antonagon. Do you know what that event might have been? The uh, uh, wreck of the Emmys Fitzgerald. No, no, no. We're <laughs> talking dope. about 1855. <laughs> oh, that's way back, not the yeah, 70s. Okay. Yeah. 1850s, 1855. I was... I it was, was an event that uh, something opened at the other end of this lake. Uh, the like this, okay, the locks, yeah. okay, the locks. And so that let people come to this area. Prior to that time, there were native people who lived here. Uh, the Ojibwe have lived here for hundreds of years, but we have evidence, even on one of our islands, that there were people who visited this this area and and lived in this area for we're, not, we're talking five thousand years ago. That's hard to believe, but that's uh, that the evidence shows that uh, through carbon dating of uh, artifacts we found. Um, but 1855 was a crucial year because trying to get to this area before that time was extremely difficult. There were no roads to this part of Wisconsin. The railroad didn't get to Bayfield till the 1880s. So the only way was to use the lake. And prior to 1855 in that locks, you had to go down the St. Mary's River. Not an easy thing, and so small boats could sometimes do it, but not many. Once the locks opened, it changed us greatly. People were coming here to harvest resources. One year after those locks opened, Bayfield, Wisconsin was formed, 1856. The year after that, Ashland, Wisconsin, 1857. And so people started to move here. They were moving here to harvest resources, same from your area. So if you think about what resources might they have been after, can you name any of them for me? Oh, like uh, lumber and Lumber's quarry and mining and well, copper. And <laughs> oh, yeah, okay, yeah, one more fifth. But uh, uh, yeah. So they were building cities further south, and so they were interested. They knew there were copper deposits and iron ore deposits on the Michigan-Wisconsin border. Uh, they knew that there was the, all the big white pines here, the trees that were here that would build those cities. They, they knew that there were deposits of brownstone, and uh, they were on this islands, and they were also in the mainland here, and they were going to eventually harvest those. So people started coming here to harvest those resources. And so they came by boat, and whenever there's boat traffic, there's hazardous areas or areas that are difficult to maneuver through, and so that's the call for lighthouses. So our first lighthouse was going to be called the, and I'm going to do this a little longer. Yeah, please. The, the, our first lighthouses in the Apostles was uh, going to be called the La Pointe Lighthouse. And if you know where La Pointe is, it's yep. on Madeline Just, Island. Yep. And uh, they, they felt they needed a there uh, to, to mark the entrance to uh, La Pointe and eventually to Bayfield there. And so the government set aside money. They hired a company from Milwaukee to build that very first lighthouse in the Apostles. He came, they came to this area and they met with the, the, the representative from the lighthouse board at the time. And that board, or that person, directed them all the way out to Michigan Island to build that lighthouse. Well, if you know where that is, it's I not. Went there yesterday. The point. Yeah. You know, it's a ways out. And so they constructed that very first lighthouse. They hired the lighthouse service, hired a keeper. He started work. And then a few months later, the inspector came through to inspect this brand new lighthouse to order, to, to accept payment and to pay the company. Well, they took them all the way out to Michigan, and the guy said, this isn't where this lighthouse was supposed to be built. And so they refused to pay for that first lighthouse. They made that company build the second lighthouse on the correct spot, which is on Long Island. So one year later, 1857 uh, and 58 in there, they built the second lighthouse free of charge to the government. I think it was probably the one and only time the U.S. government got a real bargain. <laughs> what an expensive <laughs> mistake to happen. Very Just... much so. <laughs> so that little lighthouse on, on Michigan remained open only one year, and then they said, 
We don't need that lighthouse. We need that other one, the, the second one. So they shuttered it. It stayed shuttered for 10 years, but as time went on, the shipping traffic changed and they found a need. And so 10 years later, they reopened that. 1859, there was a group of, of uh, mariners who petitioned the US government to build a lighthouse here at Raspberry. The reason this lighthouse was petitioned uh, to build was because of a little island out here. You can't see it. It's because that building is in the way. It's called York Island. And the ships would go around York Island on the right-hand side and make two turns to come into this channel. This is known as the West Channel. It was a major shipping channel in the early years. And uh, they had trouble making those turns, particularly at night. You might ask, well, why didn't they go through this channel? You can see the open channel between that second island, that sand island, and the mainland. Uh, that's because it's very shallow. There's sections over there that are only six, seven feet deep. Big boats, no way. Had to go around the two islands to come into the channel here. Government set aside this island as a lighthouse reserve, 1859. The lighthouse was constructed in 1862. It opened one year later, and you might say, well, what the heck is that all about? Why would they leave a lighthouse sitting? It's ready to go. Well, the key element of, uh, for a lighthouse was missing. What would that be? The Fresnel lens? Yes, very good. <laughs> the Fresnel lens was missing. It was shipped from, from France, of course, where they were all made at the time, and it got lost along the way here. Well, it took a while, but they found it. It was in a warehouse in Detroit, Michigan. They shipped it again. And it uh, eventually got here, but not until 1863. This lighthouse opened July 21st, I believe, of 1863. So it became the third lighthouse in the Apostles. The house that you're looking at is not the original, but parts of it do come from the original. It's on the exact same spot. Some of the materials were used uh, over again, but it was enlarged. And that, that enlargement into what you're looking at today took place a number of years later, 1905. You might say, well, why did they have to build a bigger house? Because that's a pretty substantial house. You walked around it. You saw it. It's per fairly large. Mm -hmm. The first house, very small. One family lived here in the early years. Well, through the years, things changed, and they felt a need to add more and more staff here. And the biggest reason was the building of this large brick building that you see over here. Uh, this is called the Fog Signal Building. So that was, again, requested by the guys running the ships. They said, you know, when it's foggy or smoky, we have trouble seeing the light, and that's our guidance to get through the, into the position into the channel. We need a fog signal here government listened again and they said we'll construct a fog signal 1903 that building was under construction and was built inside of that building originally two steam engines run by coal would build up steam whistles were sounded on top of the of the building you're a, a lighthouse house person so you, those whistles were timed just like the light was timed you probably know all about that and that's so you could tell the difference which lighthouse you were passing each light had a different se sequence or a different color uh, each fog signal used either whistles or horns and was a different sequence of timing. All of that was told to you as a mariner in your maps so you'd know which lighthouse. Do you know even the maps of that era would describe the exterior of the building so you knew exactly which lighthouse you were passing if you came by here during the day. Once that uh, a fog signal opened, they needed a larger house. So two years later, 1905, they remodeled the house, major remodeling, and from then on, three families lived here. Inside the house that's facing you right at the moment here was where the keeper lived. He was the boss guy. Hi, guys. Hey, we, we changed our mind. We'll do that. All right. Well, and, um, other gentleman here, I didn't even ask his name. So those are the living room windows in the original lighthouse. Just repurposed them. I'm going to guess some of the other materials also came from that when they remodeled the house. Second building, a summer kitchen. Uh, on a hot day like today, by gosh, you were cooking in your house with wood stoves. You didn't want to heat the house up any more than you had to. So you did your cooking in a separate building that was used as a cabin at times too. Third building, an outhouse for the keeper. Fourth building, stored general supplies and also wood at times that they would use for burning in their uh, stoves and so on. Beyond that, you can't see it right now, but there's another outhouse there. Uh, for the assistant keepers. The articles are, most of the articles are reflective of that time period based upon our evidence and pictures. So. Thank you. Uh, of course, this is the kitchen of the house. Um, 
wood stove in the kitchen would have been used for all of the cooking at the time. I mentioned we have the building across the way that we would have done on a hot day like today. Fire would have been started in this little compartment here. Would heat up the whole stove. Has an oven at the bottom. Has a little warming oven even up here. Pretty nice for a wood stove. Pretty fancy wood stove for a lighthouse, I can say. Usually lighthouses had not fancy things because um, they had to transport all their stuff out here. Would the stoves would have stayed to be for the next residents, but uh, each year, half, every half year, they moved some of their stuff out of here, and once they were done here, they had to get their furniture even out of here. Uh, a lot of things got left, I can guarantee you that. So here we have a kitchen sink and a pump on it. He connected to cisterns in the basement. They're still down there. Cisterns are large vessels that collected rainwater from the roof. When they remodeled this building in 2005 and six. They kept all of those architectural details. So if you look at the downspots, they go right down in the ground. We don't use them any the cisterns anymore, but they wanted to make sure that it was true to how this place looked uh, at that time. Uh, no refrigeration, of course, out here. Uh, in 1922, everybody had an ice box, and you uh, had an ice man come to your house if you lived in Antonag, and I didn't even ask where you guys are from. Where you well. Wyoming. Ooh, you're a long ways from home. <laughs> well, you would have had a nice man even probably out there if you were lucky. I don't know, unless you live out in the wilderness. Uh, but if you, uh, here these guys are in Iowa, they didn't live here in winter, you couldn't cut your own ice. So they lived without refrigeration. What they had was down in the cellar, they had a box that was about this big that they could put things in, and then they had a hole dug that went down into the ground, and it would, uh, uh, it would keep things cool. Two doors here. First door goes to the cellar. Second door is a, is a, uh, 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 a um, pantry. We're going to walk through a pantry. That'll take us through. So this room, of course, is the dining room of the house. Uh, it's a place to eat, but you can see and it was also an office for the keeper. One of the duties that the keeper was required to do every day is write in the logbook. We still have the logbook that tells what the stories of what happened here. Every single day this was an active lighthouse. We have only one item in this house that dates to when this lighthouse opened in 1863. It's the clock on the wall that was here when the lighthouse opened, and we're very happy to have that back here. I get to wind it every other day, so it's our oldest uh, uh, particular item in the house. Mm -hmm. This is the keeper of this light. His name is Lee Ellsworth Benton. Mr. Benton started with the lighthouse service in 1905. He started out on Devil's Island. That's our furthest island out. When you started with the lighthouse service, you didn't become a keeper right away. Excuse me, you started off as an assistant. He was second assistant out there, worked his way up to first assistant, got transferred over to Minnesota's North Shore, worked at a couple lights up there, including Minnesota's most famous lighthouse, Split Rock. And finally, in 1914, he was offered the head keeper's job here. He moved here with his wife, Anna. She was thrilled. The house had just been remodeled into this. In fact, the, the, the week that she moved here, she bought a postcard that had a picture of this lighthouse on it, and she wrote to her best friend, and she described this lighthouse in all its details. And what did she focus on? All the closets in the house. <laughs> she talked about those closets in each bedroom. There was a closet in the parlor. There was two pantries that uh, were, she thought that was a really big thing to talk about, I guess, but she could, loved it. Could you imagine if they would have been put out at Standard Rock, how oh, she would have felt about that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this was kind of uh, a great, uh, it still is, you know, one yeah, of the spots. One it's of the better, one better assignments, yes, eh? Yes, yeah, very much so. This is Harold. Harold, uh, uh, was their son. He was seven years old when they moved here in 1914. Uh, again, he was 17 10 years ago, when they, 10 years later when they moved away from here. What do you think? Would you have liked to have grown up in a lighthouse? Sure. You would have. Not me. Why would you have liked it? I love this old steamer trunk.
few things, so that's why we would do it back there. This is the light that was up in this tower for many years. It's in a museum today over on the Island Island. State Historical Society Museum was removed from here in 1957 and placed there. This is pretty close to size. It was a fifth order Fresnel lens. I'm doing a little more detail than I normally would talk about. The order refers to the size and they ran from one to six, plus a middle one that was a three and a half. That's what they had out of Michigan Island, by the way. It's in our headquarters, park headquarters in Bayfield. And so this was one of the smaller, fifth order. It was only lighting this channel, so it didn't have to be seen way, way out. The lens refers to this inner piece here. These are prisms at the top and at the very bottom of this light, single pieces, and they were glued or cemented together. And they were designed to bend or refract light. And so the light would be produced originally from a small oil lamp inside of there. And when they lit the oil lamp, all of these prisms would capture the light rays and send the light rays or bend them towards the center of the light and then shoot it out as a beam into the lake. This panel was added later because originally it was a fixed white light. But it was added a few years later because there was more lighthouses here in the Apostles and each one had to be seen differently. So they then had to have a flash of the light to create that different symbol. The panel here was what rotated around the light and would be seen as a flash of the light. This light would flash, it was a white light flashing once every 60 seconds. Um, no, she likes it. Okay. Yeah. Again, this room was called the tool room. Providing tools to be used for lighting and light, for maintenance and light. On the ladder at crime, please be careful as you go up. Please lay hand raises as you get towards the top. So I think this is where the light was, right here. You go out the front door. Would you mind repeating what you were saying about the lighthouse on Sand Island? Sure. Sand Island is in this direction, so I'm going to switch and go over here. So, from the 18, later 1890s all the way through 1945, there was a community of people who lived on Sand Island year-round. They were farmers and fishermen. There was also a lighthouse there on the north end of that island. That lighthouse was opened in 1881. It had only two keepers. It was only open for 40 years. First keeper stayed there for 10 years. And the second keeper stayed there for 30 years. And then they decided to shutter that lighthouse because it, grew, it be, just became of less importance. And by then, 1921, they had automation for lighthouses. They used acetylene as the lighting source and they, uh, it was an automatic system. Keepers here in Raspberry were in charge of that light. They built a trail. You can see where that trail goes, right there. It goes out one mile, out to an overlook. And way in the distance at that overlook, you can see the Sand Island light. And uh, they would go out just at sunset and make sure that light was lit. If it wasn't, they had to run back here, get in their boat, head out to sand, and relight, or change the canister of fuel for that particular light. So that was the very first of the Apostle lights that got automated. It was a unique station because it was the only one that really had a community of people right on that island there. So it kind of made it an interesting little spot there. Stan, uh, is there 21 or 22 islands? 22 are in uh, uh, 22 Apostle Islands. Okay. 21 are part of the park. The one that isn't is Madeline Island. Gotcha. And so when the park was created, Madeline had, has a 
decent population with a lot of summer homes, it would have been impossible to, to try to buy up that type of amount of property. So Madeline was kept separate out of the, uh, the, the, the national park here, but all the other islands are all part of the National Lakeshore. And is it Sand Islands in a different county? Uh, yeah, the, uh, so is this one. There, there's a couple of them that are in uh, Bayfield County. Bayfield County is, is from here kind of over. And then uh, where you were before, places like uh, um, Oak Island and Michigan Island and Outer Island are part of Ashland County. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay. Thank you.